So we're standing on the cliffs at the old head of Kinsale, which is where I grew up, in a very large family of nine children, and I'm the youngest. And this, in a way, was our playground where we could run through the fields, and it's a dairy farm, so we would have been helping on that with the cows. So it's just a very big, strong part of us. Mother's blood, sister's songs, the story of how the genetics of Iceland reveals its Irish motherhood with composer Linda Buckley. Episode one, Mother's Blood. It's a very dramatic part of the coastline. It's jutting out two miles into the Atlantic Ocean. And so you have the Atlantic Ocean around you at three sides. So it almost in some ways feels like you're on an island, but you're just connected with one small strip of land. So in that sense, you kind of feel a little bit removed from the rest of the country. We were always hearing, I suppose, the sounds of the sea, I think, runs through almost everything that I do, whether unconsciously or actually in recorded sound. Also sound of birds, seagulls. And I think definitely the foghorn was a huge memory for me growing up and, and the kind of haunting melancholy of it through the fog. And I remember it's one of my earliest memories of sound is hearing that. Well, I think, I mean, over the years I would have heard music that came from Iceland, so it would have been Björk and it would have been Sigur Rós. I mean, I was listening to that music, I suppose, as a teenager, and I never really connected with it in my head that it was maybe to do with landscape, but actually, of course it is. Because, I mean, when I went to Iceland in 2014, I really felt that many aspects of the landscape felt very connected to here as well. But I loved the sound world of the language, actually. So the, the first time I worked with that would have been in this piece called How Stid Nalgast Fall Approaches, which uses Icelandic text. And it's all to do with autumn approaching and how we have to get ready for the darkness descending. But we know that we are going to be safe because there's lights from the stars in the sky looking down upon us. And so there's a lovely idea of, even though darkness is coming, that there's a beauty in it as well. I mean, I heard a recording of Steindor Andersen, who was chanting the reamer of, of House of Nalgast, and it was also to do with the strange kind of accents and pronunciation and certain stresses on syllables that I felt were quite unusual, which is part of reamer chant as well. And I started to delve a little bit more into his work and then of course he later went on to work with people like Sigur Rós. I think a lot of what Sigur Rós were doing, you know, the, the nature of hope, Landic, which is the Ansi's made up language, which is sort of quasi Icelandic. It has this beauty in a way because you're not honing in on the meaning or semantic meaning behind the words. You're actually just really listening for the sound. And I feel like that sometimes when I sing Shanos in other places that, you know, is not Ireland, where maybe the Gaelic is not being understood in a very clear way, that it's a quick pointer towards the emotion of the song rather than the actual meaning of the words.
Well, the minute I stepped off the plane, I really felt this, you know, is somewhere I always had to be and it felt so natural to be there. And we drove from Reykjavik to Lugavath, which is about two and a half hours east. And straight away I, I saw Hekla. And I saw the lake and I just immediately kind of heard sound and started to write music very quickly when I was there. Well, it almost felt as though everything I was writing became wider, like panoramic, and expanded out, even in a sort of a spatial way. And I think that's just to do with the landscape being so wide and so open and horizon lasting for so long that it feels like I didn't want to be hemmed in and it was like the music had to break out into something much wider. I mean, I remember walking down the street and seeing people who actually looked quite like me and thinking, what is this about? And being quite puzzled by it. And then seeing a lot of actually girls at the time with long red curly hair and freckles and things. And I was thinking, these look more Irish than the Irish themselves and what's happening there. I suppose I, I'm looking for something concrete and tangible that gives evidence to what I've always felt, which is this strong connection. And in a way, I felt like it was almost this imagined world within me that, that felt like those places were very linked. And now it's so amazing to discover that there's an actual reality to this. And I really want to learn more about that. So before I head to Reykjavik and explore those genetic links between me and Iceland, I want to find out more about the Vikings, these Norwegian farmers turned raiders who dominate 9th century Ireland and who later go north to Iceland, often with Irish slaves. The really big increase in Viking raiding comes in the 830s. That's when we hear of flotillas of ships coming uh, to the Boyne, for example, and setting up winter camps. This is when you can say Ireland was truly under attack. And we have also evidence that uh, no longer are they just attacking coastal regions, they're actually going up the rivers and into the interior of Ireland. And this is when the monasteries, of course, come under attack. This is when the Monastery of Kells, for example, is looted repeatedly. I'm Paul Holm and I'm a professor of medieval and early modern environmental history. So I look at uh, how humans have engaged with the marine and terrestrial environments and uh, survived even in adverse times. So this is really an age of peril to Irish kings. They have to decide, do they 
pitch battle with the Vikings or do they try and perhaps uh, build an alliance with some of the Vikings against uh, other Irish kings? So we get, in a matter of 10, 15 years, this really complicated story of not just Vikings attacking, but also some Irish kingdoms seizing the opportunity of using the Vikings as mercenaries in an interior Irish battle. So in a matter of just the second or third generation, the Vikings are no longer just West Norwegians. They are also people who are based and living in Ireland. They are marrying Irish women. And they are also recruiting Irish people who suddenly see that actually I can have an opportunity to win riches if I join these uh, hooligans who have now come. So we hear of the Galgail, who are Irish, who have taken on the Norse ways of life and are turning into pirates. Paul himself is Danish and a passionate expert on the Norse age in Ireland. This is a, a period of opportunity in many ways. It's also a, a period of disruption. All the old ways are being challenged by this incoming people who are bringing warfare, of course. They're also bringing trade and they're bringing new ways of doing stuff. So by the mid ninth century, Dublin has become a linchpin in the Viking Empire, a gateway for trade and slaves. So this is what Dublin turns into. It's starting as a pirate's nest, but eventually turns into a war machine uh, that's up for the highest bidder. And the Dublin king earns huge amounts of cattle and slaves in return for offering his uh, warriors to the highest bidder. So, yeah, people are really the biggest commodity <laughs> to the Vikings because the Vikings are expanding into North, in through the North Atlantic. They need labor to be able to survive in the Faroes, in Iceland, so they bring wives who they take as slaves from their Irish neighbors. They also need rough people who can be put to work in just breaking the ground in these really harsh new environments. But of course, slavery and slaves were nothing new to Gaelic Ireland. After all, it's how St. Patrick got here. The practice of taking slaves is not just an international phenomenon. I mean, we tend to think most famously of St. Patrick in the 5th century being brought from Britain, but actually people within Ireland could be enslaved. So slave raiding could be across border territory, say, between Leinster and Munster, for example, not just overseas. So you could have Gaelic people being taken as slaves from other kingdoms. Um, you could also become enslaved in your own kingdom if you were unable to pay, for example, compensation that was set for a crime. Enslavement is a kind of ultimate sanction in a way for people who couldn't pay penalties and fines um, through legal process. So I'm Lizzie Boyle. I'm the head of the Department of Early Irish in Maynooth and I teach the medieval Irish language, literature and history. And I'm interested in the kind of intellectual culture of Ireland, especially from the 9th through to the 12th centuries. So the slave population could have been quite numerically significant, but a lot of slaves would themselves be Gaelic-speaking Irish people um, and not just people who'd been taken from, from overseas. And so Ireland is... is part of this Irish sea zone that involves people interacting, trading, 
slaving, fighting and so on. But it's a very multicultural, multilingual kind of environment. And that can seem slightly alien to us from a modern perspective. So by the late 9th century, Viking ships sail north to a land empty of people, except for some Irish monks, to a place they called Eastland, Iceland, a land of volcanoes, geysers, waterfalls and lava fields. So why did they go? I think the, the attraction of Iceland was two things. One, this was an opportunity for people who were really at loggerheads with perhaps the Norwegian king. So this was a safe route for people who maybe were outlawed or maybe were just feeling the heat of home conflicts. So it's a way out. It's also very attractive because Iceland at the time, of course, was environmentally rich. It was a place full of bird life, very importantly, full of walruses. So you can trade the tusks of these walruses to Europe. And we know that these tusks fetched a very high price. So a few centuries later, when the Icelandic sagas were written down, they talk of Irish slaves, mostly nameless, some like the Westmen, rebelling against their master and being executed, and others like the mute Melkorka, become a rare story of a hero slave. So obviously the... Uh, the story of the Irish slaves has been sort of not part of mainstream Icelandic storytelling, but they, they are there in the sagas. We hear, of course, of uh, the slaves who are rebelling. We also hear of people who make it to the top. Melkorka is, of course, the, the prime example. An Irish princess who is taken as a slave, sold at the market in, at Brenner, which is an island just off present-day Gothenburg in Sweden. And we know that Brenner at the time of the Viking period was a meeting place of Danish, Swedish, Norwegians, and also, in this case, a Russian merchant who actually is the one who is putting Melkorka on the market. And eventually she is sold to Iceland. And of course, because of her innate qualities as a princess, she makes it to become a, a renowned uh, lady of standing in Iceland, even though she's brought as a slave. Mel Corka's story intrigues me. A woman mute by choice or trauma. She reminds me of the experience of the American writer Maya Angelou, who stopped speaking after she was raped as a child. So is Mel Corka real or a myth, truth or fiction? Melkorka, she is taken in, in captivity, hails from Ireland, and Laxdala Saga tells the story of how Herskuldur, who is a, a powerful character in the, in the west of Iceland, in the Dalish region, he goes abroad, he's in Norway, and he uh, is at a, an assembly, and there's a, a tent where women are being sold, um, slaves, women who've been captured and brought from Ireland or other places to Norway, sold into slavery. 
and he likes the look of one of them and he buys this woman. And the man who is selling these women tells Höskuld that there's one thing she should, he should know about this woman and that is that she can't speak, she has no voice. But Höskuld buys her anyway, um, takes her back with him to Iceland and it keeps her as his mistress or his concubine. And he is already married, so his wife, Jórun, back in Iceland, is far from delighted at this turn of affairs. My name's Emily Lethbridge, a research lecturer in the Department for Name Studies at the Albany Magnusson Institute for Icelandic Research in Reykjavik, Iceland. And is there mention of Ireland and the Irish within this? So Melkurka, she has this son who's called Olavur, and it's discovered that she can, in fact, talk. A story. She's not without a voice. When Höskuldur overhears her talking with her young son, Olavur, outside nearby the farmhouse. There he saw two people whom he recognized, his son Nolafer and the child's mother. He then realized that she was anything but dumb, as she had plenty to say to the boy. And he realizes that she, it's not that she can't speak, it's that she's just refused to speak. If you wish to know my name, it is Melkorka. Hoskult asked her for details of her family. She answered, My father is Melkorton. He is a king in Ireland. And I was taken captive there at the age of 15. Hoskult said that she had too long concealed such noble birth. And Melkorka has taught Oliver. Irish. So when Olavur in turn goes off on a search for his origins and gains great fame and renown outside of Ireland, he sails to Ireland and can converse with the, the Irish who he meets and manages to meet his Irish grandfather and uh, stays as part of his grandfather's retinue for some time and, and becomes highly honoured by Mirkjartan. So in the sagas, in the Laxdela saga, Melkurka's father is King Mir Kjartan, or in Irish, Mir Kjartuch, of the Alla Kingdom in Donegal. The Irish annals speak of him as a great warrior, who was once taken captive by the Vikings, but ransomed back for a huge sum by his own people. So is his daughter Melkorka, or Melkorkig as some scholars translate it, and is that when she was taken captive? In the saga, Melkorka's son, Olafur, goes on to become one of the heroes of early Iceland. But it's that idea of Melkorka, a stolen 15-year-old girl sold into slavery, probably raped, shipped to a strange land, and then teaching her child Irish, that continues to haunt me.
in some ways, I can identify with characters in the sagas like Melkorka more than 10 years ago because I feel the, the tug of having family in two places. So Melkorka in Laxtyla saga is when Olavr comes back to, to Iceland, Melkorka is you know, delighted that her son has found his grandfather and, and she's most of all you know, delighted that he's met her old nurse, um, but she's very disappointed that Olav didn't bring this old nurse back with him to Iceland so she could be reunited with her. When you've grown up in one country or one place and you move to another country as an adult and start a family there, there'll always be that that emotional tug because you've left people that are dear to you behind but you know I have people who are dear to me here in this country I couldn't really be happier with my choice of new home not least uh, <laughs> time of recording when all kinds of chaos is going on in Westminster Iceland feels like a much safer place to be and it's a wonderful place to have a family and bring up children The story of the Irish slave women, like Melkorka, is one you hear everywhere in Iceland. It's always been there as a story. But that story has now been confirmed by science and turns Iceland's sense of its pure Viking origins on its head, as genetic studies show the first settler women were predominantly Gaelic, women from Ireland and Scotland. These were Iceland's first mothers. There's a book that was written about a thousand years ago called The Book of Settlement. And The Book of Settlement says that Iceland was settled by Norwegian Vikings, or young Norwegian men who stopped by the British Isles, picked up women and uh, picked up slaves and went up to Iceland and settled down. And the story says that these were disgruntled people who couldn't tolerate Harald the Fairhead who took over the whole of Norway. And they did not want to live under his uh, command, so they went up to Iceland. My name is Kauri Stefansson, and I'm a human geneticist working in Iceland. We took a look at this and we actually looked at mitochondria, the energy stations of the cells, as a micro-maternal lineage. And we looked at the, the Y chromosome as a micro-paternal lineage. And basically, we showed that in current-day Iceland, about 75% of the Y chromosomes are Norwegian, and about 65% of Icelandic mitochondria are Celtic. But this is in the current day Icelandic population. But we have lived here for 1100 years in an extraordinarily tough environment. Very little or very difficult agriculture and fishing in small boats in a very difficult sea. So we decided to go and look at the DNA from the settlement of Iceland from graves from the time of the settlement. And we looked at the same markers, we looked at the mitochondria and we looked at the Y chromosomes. And indeed, what came to us as a surprise is that the current day Icelanders are much more different from the settlers of Iceland than current day Norwegians and current day Brits. So this merciless island has changed us more than your population has been changed by this continuous stream of people coming through. 
It's remarkable. We, we know that these Norwegian boys, they picked up women who went up to Iceland to settle down. And we have no information on how large percentage of these women went up to Iceland with what we would call in today a mutual consent. I think it is possible that some of them were not particularly pleased by having to go up to Iceland. There are very significant events that uh, indicate that we were different from the Norwegians. We started to write books before then. Basically, everything that is known about the uh, old history of Norway was written in Iceland. So I think that people have had all kinds of reasons to question that we were pure Norwegians. And we just are who we are, all right? There's nothing we can do about it. I think that we have always been very fond of the Gaelic aspect of who we are. I think that we have looked at ourselves as a nation of, of writers, people of literature, and, and I think that we have always somehow thought that it came with a, with a Celtic mix. So it came from our mothers, not from our fathers. <laughs> Oslan is killed on the what I have found from the very beginning of doing research on that subject is that people are embarrassed. It's, it's embarrassing that those blonde, fair heroes with the blue eyes who are, you know, fighting each other with these huge weapons, that they actually had slaves. And, we, well, our word for slave is threat, and that's where we get the word thralls. And some claim that the status was not the same as when you think of a slave in the plantations of uh, America in, in 200 years ago. <laughs> My name is Vilborg Dagesdóttir, Vilborg, daughter of David, and uh, I'm a writer, and I'm an ethnologist, and I'm a widow, and I'm a mother of three children, and a granny of two babies. <laughs> So we have, we know about them, but people haven't li really liked talking about it because it doesn't fit with that, you know, the image of the hero. But I think gradually people are realizing that the story must have been quite different when you have that, all that genetic research. So it fits perfectly with the idea that there's, these are young men going out on the Viking ships, doing their raiding, and they uh, capture women. They take women from themselves. Sometimes the sires are about people have settled in the British cells and the second generation comes to Iceland. And so we get the, the DNA from there. You say that you've been somewhat obsessed with this connection between Ireland and Iceland over the years and our four mothers who come from Ireland and Scotland. And what sparked this interest? And this, of course, is connected to your first novel, yeah. Kurka. You know, I grew up in a small village in the Westfjord Peninsula in Iceland called Sinkere. Sink is the uh, Icelandic word for an assembly or a gathering of the Norse where they came together to uh, enforce the laws and proclaim the laws and so on. And um, in the middle of that tiny village, which is just uh, four or five hundred people living there, there are quite a few small hillocks or knolls. And these, uh, according to the lore, the local lore, is the place where people would come gather for that assembly in the age of the settlement when the first people came there. And I remember thinking, 
That must have been wonderful. What was it like for the people coming here in the ninth century? What was it like to come, to be the very first one to see that land? What would have surprised them? What would they have thought about it? And who were they? And then I somehow I discovered that yes, they were obviously they were from Scandinavia, mainly from Norway, but they had with them a lot of slaves. And we have stories about these people that they came from Ireland and they came from Scotland. But we don't know much about them. So when I decided in my twenties that I would want to try to write uh, a novel, I thought I'll go back to the very first times of Icelandic history. And you just look at these people that were here these 30 generations ago. They were still just like us. They were people. They had their grief, their laughter, their tears, their destiny, whatever. But still, they're just people. The past did happen. History is just what someone wrote down. Write it down, they did. The Icelandic sagas is a unique collection that gives us everything we know of the Vikings. But there are also stories, like soap operas, of family life, written hundreds of years after settlement began, shaping what it means to be an Icelander. The thing that's special about Iceland and the Faroe Islands, of course, is that there was nobody here except for a a few slightly lost, puzzled uh, hermits who were enjoying themselves in peace until the Vikings started coming along. My name's Terry Gunnell, Professor of Folkloristics at University of Iceland. And why do you think it's important for us to tell our stories upon arriving to a new land? Is it a sense of mapping ourselves onto the landscape? Yeah, this was a land which which had no maps, it had nothing. The people coming here had never encountered anything of that kind. When you're coming here, first of all, you have where do you bury your dead? At home, you've got graveyards which have been going from the Bronze Age. At home, you know where the, the hidden people live, the spirits of the land live. When you come here, where, where, where do you go? Where do the dead go? What language do you use with this land? It smells different, it bubbles differently to the land at home. So it's a pretty frightening space. And I find what's particularly interesting here is that you've got to create sacredness, sacred spaces, a little bit like the places on the farm you don't touch, that you maybe leave things out for the, for the, for the spirits. So yes, definitely, but you're coming here, you're mapping out the landscape, and one way of mapping out a landscape is by telling stories about it. I talk about legends that are sort of implicit legends, that, that, that somebody says, oh, and that's that, that place over there is a, it's, it's an enchanted spot. And you say, why? 
Skeggöld, skálmöld, skildirur, klopnir, vindöld, vargöld á þú veröld steypist. So stories I, I've described as being a sort of a map of not only landscape, it tells you where things happen, it gives a, a new dimension to the landscape, it, it turns it from being a geological happening to something that's got history, that's got background, that's got different dimensions to it. It's a bit like a map being placed on top of the landscape. So I often say that um, so the people of modern people of Iceland they are in a sense aboriginals in this country because there's no earlier culture that has cultivated the land. So reasonably living memory still among the current population of the absolute beginning of human habitation. So when all the uh, first place names were given, where the uh, first farms were built, and who built them, and where they came from, and uh, what their name was, and who their descendants were. And I think just living in with that um, sense of absolute beginning is uh, unique in, in the world. I'm Gisli Sigurdsson, I work here as a research professor at the Arne Magnusson Institute for Icelandic Studies. You don't have a culture of that kind anywhere else. The uh, people who moved to uh, New Zealand and Madagascar relatively late, they don't have um, that uh, written version of their oral memory from so close to the beginning that it can still be argued that there is some historical authenticity behind it. The people who were writing these sagas down were those who were the ones with the power in the 13th century, which is the, the century when these oral stories were being turned into written literature. So we do have a perspective from above rather than from below. I think first and foremost they're you know they're family stories so they're, they're 13th century Icelanders looking back on their family origins and the circumstances in which their ancestors came to Iceland and built new lives for themselves in a new country. So we have um, you know, both those who are said to have been descended from powerful chieftains, families in Norway or royal families, and then you know farmers and, and slaves too. So people hailing from different backgrounds and different levels of society all, all coming together and building new lives together. This need to shape an identity made storytellers, poets and musicians of the Icelandic people. What stories did those first mothers, those Gaelic women, tell their children? Are stories, rhyme and song the traces of their lives? I began my uh, university studies here in the same building and was soon drawn to the uh, old and medieval literature of Iceland and in particular the question of origins and how it came about that Iceland was the only country within the Scandinavian family of nations to um, 
produce this wealth of literary material. And one of the ideas that had come up in the scholarship already in the 19th century was that this was because of the uh, Gaelic contribution to the um, culture of uh, Iceland. And we know that the um, professional status of poetry and storytelling was much higher in uh, Irish culture than we know of in the Germanic um, speaking countries. And uh, it soon dawned on me that there was much more to this uh, Gaelic um, contribution to Icelandic culture that had really been acknowledged. And have you seen traces of connection between Gaelic folktales and Icelandic in terms of themes of hidden people, puka, fairies, and sometimes they're not always such positive creatures? It most definitely. You've, you've, you've got a number of traces running through there, of course. Um, since the Gaelic people were largely slaves, then there was, a, there was a move to shut down the language and things of that kind but, um, for fear of, I suppose, slave rebellion of one kind or another. But at the same time, you've got the um, the slaves, especially the slaves are bringing the children up. So they're passing on their stories and their beliefs, it was under the fence in some way or other. So you find definitely a number of traces of these stories within the sagas. And certainly the sport of Knatlik, that you get regularly in the sagas, to my mind, is, is based on hurling. Yeah, well, belief in uh, the little people, the fairy folk in Ireland was extremely strong until relatively recently, and it seems to be still quite strong um, in Iceland. My name is Eilish Nigwivna, or Eilish Nigwivna Almquist. I'm a writer of fiction, uh, mainly non-fiction and other forms as well, and I'm also a folklorist. It does seem to have been uh, much stronger in Ireland, the fairy faith, uh, until recently and that ordinary people just took it for granted that there were another <laughs> community living alongside them and invisible and it, it does seem to be pretty much the same in Iceland. And, the, and Icelanders claim that they still believe in them, though few Irish people I think would go that far, although we still have this uh, thing which folklorists call half-belief, so you don't believe in the fairies, but on the other hand you won't do anything to annoy them. So I think that does seem to be something that we have in common with the Icelanders. Because the fairies in Ireland are largely malevolent. They're not nice people. <laughs> They're mostly out to get you, to, you know, to be on your guard, not to um, annoy them by building on their paths or cutting down their trees or upsetting them in any way. It seems like a belief which is attached to kind of having a, a, a respect for the mysteriousness of, of nature. And I think you get that in Iceland as well. Sigurdsson went to UCD in the 1980s. He studied under Eilish's late husband, the Swedish scholar Bo Amquist. Giesli's master's thesis made the case for Gaelic influences in Iceland's settlement, seeing echoes in the sagas of the Irish legends like Cú Cullen. But back then, long before Cowrie Stephenson's research, it was not a popular theory.
And then the results of your thesis were very much confirmed by research in genetics. Like, how did that feel to know that that really was a very concrete, tangible reality? You know, you know that was uh, like so I told you so feeling, because uh, when I came with my um, book that was published in 1988, it was a very unpopular idea. And historians here, retiring or recently retired, they are still in a state of denial about, uh, against these uh, genetic um, studies from the uh, 90s and early 2000s that demonstrate that a large proportion of the population was actually with an um, Irish and Scottish genetic uh, background. In addition to all the Norsemen who had grown up in um, the mixed cultural uh, Norse colonies in Ireland and the Isles and that then emigrated f second or third generation to, to Iceland. So they would not have been um, with a living memory of anything directly from Norway, but rather from this new culture that they were growing up with in Ireland. So uh, this is a, a massive cultural input coming from a very different part of the world from Norway. And this has not really been acknowledged in, um, yet in historical studies of Iceland. And um, I, I still feel that the whole early history has just to be rewritten and redefined in light of these uh, genetic studies. It's a very sensitive idea still. To, and it's also sensitive from the Irish perspective, so that uh, they were enslaved, so who wants to have a memory of that? That's uh, something you want to just fade out of, uh, out of your memory. And uh, the slavehood, uh, we don't really know much about how that was practiced in this community. And uh, we have iso many isolated farms, and uh, uh, there are slaves, and there are uh, not so free people, and, uh, and where is the... Um, defining line it can be very problematic and um, the, uh, the slave memory is uh, uncomfortable and we have a situation of silencing in the study of the past also. We have a long tradition of uh, silencing uh, women in all historical studies or turning a blind eye towards them, not seeing them. And um, a perfect example is, so Mel Korka, she, the only reason she gets uh, attention is because she is a princess. And uh, so she gets uh, mentioned again and again and remembered because of that. And uh, then uh, if you have um, the addition of a, sort of a slave and a woman, then um, you just uh, don't even give her a name. You give her perhaps a, a Norse name that you can remember and you um, silenced her completely. And if the sagas give us in Melkorka, a mute Irish slave who hides her voice, her language and her story in our next and final chapter of Mother's Blood Sister Songs. We seek out female voices, stories and songs, including that of a modern day Melkorka who traces herself and her baby son back to her legendary namesake. <laughs> I was quite proud of my name. I was happy that I had this special name. We here in Iceland, we can trace our ancestry back. And I'm the 29th from Melkorka, according to this book. And my son, who's here in the womb, he will be the 30th. So that'd be exciting. <laughs> <laughs>